Welcome to the second part of the lecture. Uh, we will start now <clears throat> while the others join and I'll share the screen with you first. All right, so we will start with part two and uh, we are going quite soon and the objective is to uh, convey the things to you in a clear way. And I hope you are getting what we are trying to do and you're understanding uh, the mechanisms of actions and the side effects and indications for different drugs, all right? So <clears throat> this is where we stopped yesterday. We are going to now start with dipyridamol, which is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor in the platelets. Uh, and uh, it also potentiates the actions of prostacycline, right? So when you have increased levels of, uh, uh, you know, what does phosphodiesterase do? The, the action of phosphodiesterase is to destroy cyclic AMP, right? Uh, we need higher levels of cyclic AMP to prevent aggregation. So. Uh, yesterday, I caused a little bit of confusion that I'll clear today. Uh, so, dipyridamol inhibits phosphodiesterase and it increases intracellular cyclic AMP. Uh, and not only that, it has got other mechanisms as well. It is a vasodilator as well. So, increased cyclic AMP decreases thromboxane A2 levels in platelets and it causes coronary vasodilation as well, and it augments prostacycline effects. Actually, it increases the levels of prostacycline. So all these effects are leading to platelet uh, inhibition of platelet aggregation, and they are also causing vasodilation. Therapeutic use is stroke prevention in combination with aspirin. Uh, bioavailability is variable after oral administration, which is a bit of a problem. Uh, metabolism is hepatic and excretion is also hepatic. Uh, so there could be some drug interactions with the drugs that either induce the hepatic enzymes or the drugs that inhibit the hepatic enzymes. Coronary steel phenomena, because it is a vasodilator, it is not recommended in unstable angina because of diversion of blood flow to non-ischemic regions, right? What, what is coronary steel syndrome? It is just that in the heart, the uh, coronary arteries which are healthy, they dilate more than the obstructed arteries, right? The, the arteries that are causing angina, which have got atherosclerosis, when you give a vasodilator, they do not dilate as much as the healthy arteries. So more blood flows to the healthy arteries, which means more blood is flowing to the healthy regions of the heart. So that is sort of stealing the blood from the ischemic regions of the heart. That's why it is known as coronary steel phenomena. Adverse effects uh, is headache, which is the adverse effect of all vasodilators. Orthostatic hypotension is also an adverse effect of uh, all vasodilators. There is a little bit of background noise, so I'm going to mute uh, uh, the audience. Okay. <clears throat> right. Uh, so the next thing is that this, this is what we have. We have got this in uh, IV formulation, IV use only. We have got capsules and we have got tablet 75 milligrams, okay? And this is here, uh, we were a little bit confused yesterday because um, I, this is uh, PGI2, which is prostacycline. It increases uh, cyclic AMP levels, right? Because increased levels of cyclic AMP will decrease calcium and that will eventually lead to inhibition of platelet aggregation, right? So that was just to clarify one point from yesterday's lecture. Now we go to celestazole, uh, which has the same mechanism of action as dipyridamol. Uh, it is an oral agent and like dipyridamol, it has antiplatelet and vasodilating effect. This has the same mechanism of action. It inhibits phosphodiesterase 3. In the platelets, you know, we have got uh, uh, two to three different types of phosphodiesterases, right? We have got phosphodiesterase 2, we have got phosphodiesterase 3, and we have got phosphodiesterase 5 as well. In the heart, we uh, 
We uh, have phosphodiesterase 3, which is inhibited by aminophylline and uh, methylxanthines, okay? <clears throat> Whereas these uh, performance enhancing drugs like Viagra and uh, uh, this uh, Vordenafil, Tadalafil, you know, all these drugs, they inhibit phosphodiesterase 5, okay? So <clears throat> celestazole uh, is uh, an inhibitor of phosphodiesterase 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here it is, the, uh, you don't have to memorize the brand names, but it comes in tablet form, which means it is given orally. Uh, it has got a beneficial effect on the lipids. It's not an antilipid drugs. We will do antilipid drugs perhaps after this lecture. And it increases HDL and decreases triglycerides. So both are good effects, beneficial effects. Therapeutic uses is intermittent claudication, which is which means pain in the legs on walking a little distance. Metabolism is by CYP3A4, CYP2C19, same drug that metabolizes clopidogrel, CYP1A2. So we do expect drug interactions because any drugs or genetic polymorphisms in the case of CYP2C19 enzyme, any drugs that induce or inhibit these enzymes are going to uh, affect the blood levels of cystazole, okay? Excretion is via kidneys. Adverse effects are headache due to vasodilation, GI side effects, which could be pain, dyspepsia, or diarrhea. Contraindications is in heart failure. Uh, inhibition of PDE increases mortality in patients with advanced heart failure, right? Uh, we, if you remember uh, in, uh, in the heart failure lecture, we did uh, Imbrinone and uh, those drugs which are phosphodiesterase inhibitors, right? So in the long run, they are not good drugs. Okay, uh, here is a question for you. I hope you will be able to read it. I'll quickly read it with you. A 56 year old man admitted to the hospital with a myocardial infarction underwent a percutaneous coronary intervention for revascularization of his left coronary. Which of the following drugs were most, was most likely given intravenously during the procedure? Any ideas? Okay. Right. So um, I have got something on the chat and the answer is F, which is Epsiximab, which is excellent. That is the right answer. But you see, you must read the question carefully. For example, one girl has written uh, clopidogrel. We are saying that it is given intravenously. Warfarin is given orally most of the times. Clopidogrel is, clopidogrel is given orally, right? And these drugs are not connected with this. You know, protamine is for heparin. It is a heparin antidote, and this is also an antidote for thrombolytic drugs, okay? So the correct answer actually is epsiximab, okay? They are not given IV. This is a heparin and antidote and aminocaproic acid and... Um, uh, this factor F recombinant factor 7A are used for bleeding episodes, okay? So that is the right answer. Various anticoagulant coagulation regimen are always initiated before, during, and after angioplasty. You know, in, previously we saw the oral drugs that we use before angioplasty are prasugrel, clopidogrel, and ticagrelor, okay? Uh, that I, I asked you to remember because that was an important point. Heparin not listed and epsiximab are the two drugs which are given IV for this purpose. Which drug you choose depends upon the condition of the patient and the physician's preference. All right. So now we um, switch gears and we go on to another topic, which is uh, anticoagulant. So far, we have done antiplatelet drugs. And here I am showing you what I have already shown you before, that when the uh, endothelium gets damaged, the platelets are exposed to collagen and the platelets get activated and they secrete a lot of granules that are going to uh, set into motion the clotting pathway. 
so through a long cascade of these clotting uh, pathways in the intrinsic uh, pathway, we get uh, conversion of prothrombin, which is factor two to thrombin, which is factor two A, and that thrombin converts fibrinogen to a fibrin, which uh, is the final step in this coagulation cascade, okay? Uh, so here is fibrin, right? You what? This is also an electron micrograph. It's a, a real picture, I guess. Uh, and you see all these fibrin threads over here. These fibers, they 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 make a meshwork in which the RBCs are trapped, the white blood cells are trapped, you know, and it goes on increasing unless it is stopped. You know, clot formation it goes on expanding until there are factors in the blood that have the ability to stop the expansion of the clot, or we can use some drugs to stop the expansion of clots when the process sets in, all right? So what I'm trying to show you here is that fibrin is a sticky substance, right? It's, it will uh, trap everything. It will get stuck, everything will get stuck to it, just like this uh, chewing gum or, you know, like Spider-Man's uh, web, you know, that is also something very sticky. So this is the extrinsic pathway. It is activated when there is tissue damage and it starts through tissue factor and factor seven, and then it will go on to the common pathway. And here is the intrinsic pathway, which involves a lot of clot factors. It is activated by contact with collagen or negatively charged molecules in the vessel wall. And lots of factors, you know, collagen, high molecular weight, kinase, pre kelly factor 11, 11A, factor, uh, sorry, this is factor 12, factor 11, factor 10, factor 9, all of these are involved. And all of these lead to, you know, activation of factor 10 to factor 10A. And factor 10A is going to convert prothrombin to thrombin. And then eventually we will get conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, right? So I'm showing you this pathway because now we are going to study anticoagulant drugs and we will keep this as our main um, uh, schematic for identifying the mechanism of actions of drugs, all right? So uh, inhibitors of coagulation and uh, fibrinolysis are protein C, protein S, antithrombin 2, they inhibit coagulation, okay? Tissue factor pathway inhibitor, antithrombin, <clears throat> you know, you'll see heparin works uh, on this molecule, is a small protein produced by the liver. It inactivates thrombin, factor 10A and factor 9A, all right? So main action is on thrombin and factor 10A. The rate of inactivation is accelerated 2,000 to 4,000 fold in presence of heparin and another drug which is known as fondaparinex, okay? So uh, this is something that happens inside the blood vessel. This is a blood clot. And I said that the blood clot, if once it starts forming, it goes on, it goes on expanding. It goes on becoming bigger until something in the blood stops it from growing bigger. And once the clotting cascade starts, there is activation of substance substances that break down, down the clot, okay? So we keep a balance in the body uh, and that is quite complicated. So one of the factors that can break down this clot is tissue plasminogen activator. And we will come to the drugs as well that work like tissue plasminogen activators. It is usually, uh, inhibited, it is in inactive form in the blood because of plasmin activator inhibitor, right? But plasminogen is here. Plasminogen must be converted to plasmin to break this. So what happens is that through certain mechanisms, this inhibition is removed and tissue plasminogen activator converts plasminogen into plasmin. And then plasmin breaks down this clot. It, uh, um, it breaks down the fibrin fibers. And what we get is fibrin degradation products that we look for in certain conditions where the clotting is high. So we look for fibrin degradation products. So they're okay. Right. <clears throat> 
So um, then we have got a plasmin activator inhibitor as well. You know, it all it shows is there is a complex mechanism that is controlling all these things. It's controlling uh, coagulation. It is controlling inhibition of coagulation. Everything is very intricately controlled, okay? So this is our drug list for the next uh, drugs that we are going to do. We have got a long list. That is why this lecture is pretty long. So heparin, low molecular weight heparins, which I showed you yesterday, they were uh, inoxaparin, deltaparin, and tinzaparin, uh, ergatroban, and bivalirudine, and desirudine, fondaparinex, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, and we have got warfarin, okay? Uh, sorry, sir, there is uh, one question from someone, and he or she is asking me to go back to this figure, and here I am. Yes, do you have a question over here? Sorry, sir, just one more back where it's broken the plasmic. Yeah, that's the one. This one? Further down. That's the one I was looking for, one before, yeah. Thank you. All right, so let's keep going. So this is our drug, drug list and we are going to do anticoagulants today. So we'll start with heparin. You see heparin comes uh, in an injectable form. We have got this heparin lock as well. You know, when you have an IV line established, sometimes you don't want it to get clogged with clotted blood. So you use this heparin lock or sometimes you have to flush the IV line when it is there for a long time. Although keeping an IV line for a long time has got side effects as well, like infection, but you have to flush it and open it up sometimes for which you use this heparin wash sort of thing. So heparin is a rapidly acting anticoagulant. Heparin occurs naturally in mast cells and um, um, in basophils as well. Okay, it is complexed with histamine. It is obtained usually from a porcine intestinal mucosa, you know. Anybody knows why we call it heparin, you know, hep, hepa, hepatic. It is, it has, does it have something to do with liver? Any ideas? Well, it has to do something with liver because it was first isolated from dog's livers, okay? That is why they called it heparin. Although it has got nothing directly, the name has got something to do with the liver, okay? Right, so unfractionated heparin is an anionic glycose aminoglycan. It is strongly acidic. Low molecular weight heparins are one third the size of unfractionated heparin. And we have got certain advantages when we use unfractionated heparin because heparin has got certain pharmacokinetic properties that make it a little bit uh, difficult to um, sort of predict its uh, plasma levels. Okay, right. So inoxaparin and deltaparin and Tinzaparin, these are the low molecular weight heparins. Mechanism of action of heparin, here is our pathway. A heparin binds to antithrombin-3, the molecule that I showed you previously, and it activates it and causes antithrombin-mediated inhibition of thrombin and factor 10A as well. Uh, 1,000 times faster than antithrombin alone. So, which means uh, a complex of heparin and antithrombin thrombin is a thousand times more potent in inhibiting thrombin and factor 10A, all right? Low molecular weight heparins complex with antithrombin and inactivate factor 10A, but they have low affinity for thrombin, right? Thrombin is factor 2A and prothrombin is factor 2, all right? All right? So this is uh, activated factor 2. Right, so here is inoxaparin injection, right? So if, if you want to have a look at the dose, it's up to you. Subcutaneous injection. There is uh, tinzaparin, again, subcutaneous. Heparin binds to antithrombin via a pentasaccharide sequence. And this is, uh, again, uh, deltaparin, which is a low molecular weight. And this is given IV and uh, subcutaneous as well. So that was the route of administration. Therapeutic uses heparin and low molecular weight heparins limit the expansion of thrombus. See, so they will not break down the thrombus. The thrombus will stay in its place. All it is doing is limiting 
the expansion of the thrombus, okay, by preventing uh, fibrin formation. Uh, used for treatment of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. These two are interconnected because it is mostly a piece of the thrombus that breaks away and flows uh, in the bloodstream and goes to the lungs and causes a blockage somewhere. So this is one of the signs and symptoms. You need swelling of the legs and uh, this uh, redness and maybe pain as well. Uh, and here it, just, it is just showing that the thrombus is forming, forming along with the wa wall of the deep vein uh, of the leg and uh, maybe something will break away from here and it will go to the lung and cause pulmonary embolism, okay? For prophylaxis in hip replacement surgery and in patients with acute myocardial infarction. Now, hip replacement surgery means that the person is not able to move his leg for a pretty long time. So there is, will be stasis of blood in the leg and a risk of deep vein thrombosis. Uh, it could be given, uh, well, heparin is safe in pregnancy because it is a big drug, large molecule, right? It does not cross the placenta. So anticoagulant of choice in pregnancy due to their large size and negative charge, okay? Uh, low molecular weight do not require the same intense monitoring as heparin, therefore, they are useful for both in and out patients. Another question, and this time you will read it yourselves. All right, this is interesting. I got one answer and remember your time is 90 seconds and the answer from Aisha is C, which is the right answer. Now you see in this question, has the clot formed or not? Is there a thrombus in the coronary vessel or not, right? He has got severe chest pain, nausea and diaphoresis. And the pain started while he was watching television, which means he was sitting, he was not moving around. Someone has written D, unfortunately, that is not the right answer. Well, the answer over here is you will see uh, this in acute coronary syndrome, if the cardiac biomarkers are not raised, CKMB and high sensitive uh, cardiac troponin, they are normal, which means it is unstable angina, okay? We have not given, uh, showed ST segment depression, okay? In multiple leads, uh, well, anyway, it is not ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and the troponins are normal. So that means most probably it is unstable angina, right? So the clot has not formed. These drugs are not given. These um, aminocaproic acid is uh, something else. We will come to that later on. Alteplase is given when the clot is formed. Okay, so the best answer is heparin and aspirin uh, because uh, heparin, it prevents the formation of clot. It cannot break down the clot. It cannot dissolve the clot. It will prevent the formation of clot and it will prevent the expansion of clot if the clot is there, right? So the correct answer in this case is uh, obviously C. Uh, there is no thrombus yet, so LTEPLase will not be used. Diagnosis is unstable angina. Treatment is oxygen, morphine, aspirin, full dose, nitrates, beta blockers, heparin, or other anticoagulant, okay? So uh, that was for this question. Now we'll go to heparin pharmacokinetics. So um, subcutaneous or intravenous uh, administration because the drug does not readily cross membranes. As we said, it is a large molecule. And these are the places where you can give subcutaneous injections, uh, which includes abdomen as well. And then um, this is uh, the dose and it is usually given in 5% dextrose injection because it is a charged molecule. So you will not give it with uh, NACL or normal saline. And this is just an infusion pump that could be used to, you can set the rate and you can set the volume, volume to be infused rate and total dose, you know, so that will take care 
of the effusion. So low, low molecular weight heparins are administered subcutaneously. Heparin administered as a bolus and then continuous infusion. Uh, we measure the activated partial thromboplastin time and we try to keep it between 1.5 and 2.5. Uh, onset of anticoagulant effect in case of heparin bolus, it's IV, it's within minutes, and subcutaneous is 1.5 to 2 hours because of slow absorption. Low molecular weight um, uh, subcutaneously given, it takes about 4 hours, okay? Monitoring is not required for low molecular weight because their plasma levels are more predictable. And in renal impairment and pregnancy, monitoring of factor 10A is required, all right? Uh, right, so for, for that's, that's for uh, in renal impaired, you know, you need monitoring uh, for factor 10A because it's, uh, it acts on that. But for heparin, you need monitoring quite frequently, all right? Uh, so this is just to remind you what prothrombin time is and activated partial thromboplastin time is. So prothrombin time uh, test is done for deficiency of factors of intrinsic pathway. It measures how long does it take the blood to clot. Here you have added an activator. Test is done for deficiency of factors like factor 8A or whatever, right? So this is just showing you the factors. And... Um, uh, if you want to read it, I've got another slide in more details, which is hidden, but uh, if you want, you can read it yourselves, all right? Right, so uh, pharmacokinetics is important. Monitoring heparin binds to a wide range of biomolecules, and that's why it is unpredictable, that neutralize its activity, causing unpredictable pharmacokinetics, thus requiring monitoring, right? So this just shows just like a dice, throwing off a dice, it is unpredictable. And um, this is the test you do to monitor heparin. We have got some gadget for that. Uh, heparin binding to plasma proteins is also variable, right? Heparin is taken up by monocytes and macrophages. So, you know, all these things make it unpredictable. Elimination is by kidneys, renal insufficiency, prolongs the half-life of low molecular weight heparins. Therefore, the dose should be reduced in patients with renal insufficiency. Half-life heparin is 1.5 hours and low molecular weight heparins is three to 12 hours, all right? Right, adverse effects. <clears throat> Bleeding is the chief complication. And with these drugs, the most dreaded complication is intracerebral hemorrhage for high-risk patients. You see the huge subcutaneous bleeding in this patient, okay? Uh, if something like that happens, you know, then you have to discontinue heparin and you have to initiate protamine sulfate. Uh, it forms ionic complexes with heparin. You have to titrate the dose of protamine uh, approximately one milligram for every 100 units of heparin. Uh, is given. Excessive dose may worsen bleeding. Protamine sulfate is a weak anticoagulant, okay? Uh, hypersensitive, see, it is a weak anticoagulant, but it is neutralizing a strong anticoagulant. So that is a, a sort of a protective uh, uh, action, okay? Hypersensitivity to, to heparin can cause fever, urticaria, and anaphylactic shock. <clears throat> Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, that's uh, a good examination question, actually. You see this patient after taking heparin has got these purpura and uh, uh, these subcutaneous uh, bleeding events. This is a, a serious immune reaction against plat platelets and heparin. It can cause thromboembolisms and you have to stop the drug over there. Long-term use can cause osteoporosis. So you have to be careful, especially in elderly or women after menopause. Contraindication is alcoholism and surgery. Right, another question for you guys. A 64-year-old man was admitted to the emergency department with presumptive diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. So please read it yourselves.
All right, so WBC looks all right, 10.2, this is within range. RBCs are within range, uh, but platelets unfortunately are low, okay? So I got one answer, which is C, and C is the correct answer. Obviously it is heparin, okay? Right, one more answer over here, which is again C from Saima. All right, now we go on to our Gatrobran, our Gatroban, okay? <clears throat> and um, it is a synthetic parental anticoagulant. And here it is, it is uh, given intravenously uh, over here it's written. And uh, it acts, it is a direct thrombin inhibitor, okay? Therapeutic use for a heparin induced thrombocyt uh, thrombocytopenia patients to prevent prophylaxis of venous thromboembolism used for used during PCI. So one of the drugs that could be used and it's an IV drug. The metabolism is by the liver and can be used in patients with renal dysfunction where heparin cannot be used, okay? And low molecular he weight heparins cannot be used over there. Half-life is 40 to 50 minutes, now not that long. And monitoring is again through activated partial thromboplastin time. And you can measure hemoglobin and hematocrit as well. All right. Okay, so uh, this just shows you the adverse effect, which is bleeding. It is just uh, symbolically showing you that it is bleeding. Now we go on to uh, these two drugs, which are by valirudine and desirudine. Okay, and uh, both are parental drugs. They are given intravenously, and they are analogs of hyrudine, which comes from the saliva of leech, okay? And here oh, you see this uh, woman is taking some sort of treatment, which is known as uh, medicinal treatment. I don't know what it is, but it comes from the saliva of the leech. It is selective reversible direct thrombin inhibitor of both free and clot bound thrombin, okay? So that is an important point to remember. So it just shows that this is also a thrombin inhibitor. Bivalirudine is used for PCI in patients undergoing angioplasty for unstable angina with high risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And uh, the dose is given, if you want to remember, half-life is 21 minutes. Dose adjustment is required in renal insufficiency. Dice, uh, desirudine, prevention of deep vein thrombosis after hip replacement surgery and the route of administration is subcutaneous, all right? So IV and subcutaneous routes of administration, mechanism of action, thrombin inhibitors, half-life 25 minutes, okay? And indications are deep vein thrombosis or a PCI. And remember, they could be used when, um, uh, there, is when there is a risk or history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And one of the adverse effects is again bleeding, which is going to be the adverse effects of all anticoagulants and uh, um, the most uh, serious adverse effect, so to say, is uh, intracranial hemorrhage, okay? Another question, sorry, I'm asking you a lot of questions, but I have to do that to keep you engaged. You have to read it yourselves. Oh my God, I think we have done this question previously as well. So this is thromboembolic stroke. It's not a, a hemorrhagic stroke. It is ischemic stroke, all right? And I got the answer and uh, the answer is D, which is very good. That is the right answer. Um, so warfarin mechanism of action inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme. Aminocaproic acid inhibits plasminogen activation. We are going to come to all these drugs. Altaplase converts plasminogen to plasmin and it will dissolve the clot, okay? Heparin, it binds with antithrombin and, and the activity increases 1000 fold or more than that, okay? Aspirin, you already know, irreversibly inactivates COX-1. So here the drug is, which works blocking platelet adenosine diphosphate receptors, which are P2 
Y12 receptors, okay? Remember P2, what this is also known as P2 Y12 inhibitor, okay? Another question. Oh my God, is this a repetition? Yes, I think I'm repeating questions. I don't know why. Anyway. Yes, you already answered this question, okay? So I hope you know what the answer is. And yes, good, that's good. It is F, right? This time we got it. And I'll quickly go through it, right? All right. Oh my God, there is another question. It's a 65 year old man. Let's see what this is. So we are looking for the therapeutic effect of uh, actually the mechanism of action of aspirin. All right, let's see whether you remember that or not. Right, I've got a few answers which are uh, very good. That is right. By now we should know what the mechanism of action of aspirin is, okay? It is irreversible acetylation of cyclooxygen oxygenase. Now we go on to fondaparinex, which is an analog of heparin. It is a synthetic pentasaccharide and a heparin analog and it selectively inactivates factor 10A, right? So it will block the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, binds to antithrombin 2 and increases the rate of activation 300 to 1000 fold. So same mechanism as heparin. After all, it's a heparin analog, okay? Therapeutic uses deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, prophylactically before surgeries, uh, it is well absorbed from subcutaneous route, route and uh, this shows that it is subcutane given subcutaneously. And uh, again, uh, this is the preparation. It, it comes as a pre-filled syringe, okay? So uh, pharmacokinetics are predictable, needs less monitoring than heparin. Elimination of kidney is through the kidneys and Obviously, it will be contraindicated in renal impairment, half-life 17 to 21 hours, and adverse effects. Uh, uh, now, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is likely, but less than heparin, okay? So that was just one quick slide on fondaparinex, and obviously, bleeding is uh, uh, an adverse effect, okay? Right, here is another question. Am I repeating questions or what? All right. This should be easy. So this is a drug that binds to antithrombin 3 and it increases its activity 1,000 fold or more than that. And the answer is, of course, E. That is very good, right? So warfarin inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme. Remember that aminocaproic acid inhibits plasminogen uh, activation. So it will, it will actually cause bleeding, right? Actually, this is used as an antidote for alteplase converts plasminogen to plasmin and uh, clopidogrel blocks binding of ADP to P2 Y12 receptors. Aspirin ir irreversibly inactivates a serine residue on the COX-1 enzyme. Our answer is heparin, which accelerates the binding by about 1,000 to 4,000 fold, okay? Now we go on to our next group of drugs, which are non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants, or they're also known as direct oral anticoagulants, okay? And, you know, uh, just to give you an idea that the risks, you know, we have got this, this is sort of a double-edged weapon, these anticoagulants. If you <coughs> overdose, there is a risk of bleeding. If you don't give the proper dose, there is a risk of 
uh, thromboembolic phenomena, right? So this is the problem we have. Por this is the potency of uh, antithrombotic drug. If it is too potent, it's going to cause bleeding, intracerebral hemorrhage, GI hemorrhage, anything else. If it is too weak, it is going to increase the risk of thromboembolism, right? So risk for an early event, which means it could be um, it could be myocardial infarction, it could be deep vein thrombosis, it could be a stroke, and risk for an early event, which is a bleeding event somewhere, and a high risk of thromboembolism, and there is a high risk of bleeding in this case, right? And this is the sweet spot that we look for, and uh, uh, these uh, these newer drugs which are known as non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants. So the name shows that they are taken orally. Debicotran is one and it has got a specific property. It binds to, you know, it is a direct thrombin in, um, inhibitor. Uh, it, it binds to thrombin, which is uh, blood clot bound and free, okay? Both are inhibited. So it will stop the expansion of the clot very effectively. Therapeutic uses is uh, prevention of stroke and prevention of systemic embolism or non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation, which is written as NVAF um, many times. Okay, it is an alternative to enoxaparin in orthopedic surgery uh, because of its efficacy. Oral bar, so see the important point, oral bioavailability and predictable pharmacokinetics, okay? All the other drugs in this group, they inactivate factor 10A. This is the only one which is inhibiting uh, thrombin, okay? And here is the drug, it says it's a prodrug. It is hydrolyzed to active form by plasma esterases, not in the liver, okay? Another point to note, plasma esterases. Uh, it has got no CYP, P450 metabolism, and it is a P-glycoprotein substrate. Anybody knows what does P-glycoprotein do to the drugs? Any idea? What is P-glycoprotein? Well, P-glycoprotein is a pump in the cells that, uh, that will pump the drug out of the cells. All right, so you know, that uh, is elimination is renal in this case. So uh, point to note is no liver metabolism, okay? And do not expose to moisture, treat the drug in uh, original container. This, this is one of the instructions that have been given. There is something on the chat. Uh, uh, well, Muhammad Jamal is saying uptake and reflux. You should say uptake and efflux of drug, all right? Not reflux, efflux of drug. Yes, that's good, okay? Right. <clears throat> Adverse effects uh, is bleeding. Risk of bleeding is higher in renal failure and patients over 75. So very old patients shouldn't do anything like this. Uh, dyspepsia, abdominal pain, GI bleeding, right? Adverse effect. The bigger trend does not need INR monitoring like warfarin, international normalized ratio. Avoid abrupt discontinuation to, uh, to avoid thrombotic events. And uh, contraindication is you should not use it in patients with prosthetic heart valves. Now, all these anticoagulants, you know, sometimes, you know, we have to stop them immediately. So if we have an antidote for these drugs, then, you know, it, it keeps us a bit, uh, uh, say, so to say, risk-free, right? Where, where, wherever we need, we can discontinue these drugs, okay? So this one is a reversal. It's known as reversal agents. They reverse the effect of anticoagulants, which is very important, all right? So this is a monoclonal antibody, uh, idarocizumab, Okay, and what is MAB? Anybody knows what, what is MAB? Uh, uh, we discussed this yesterday that it stands for a monoclonal antibody. That is very good. And what is this zoo? And what is this C? Anyone knows that? You know, the, these monoclonal antibodies, actually there is a convention to name them. So this zoo also means something, and the CCI also means something. This is the stem of the word, okay? We will come to that when we do anti Actually, we have done anti-cancer drugs. This zoo means, zoo means it is a humanized 
monoclonal antibody. And the C means it has got something to do with blood circulation. So because these uh, drugs, they are, uh, they are acting in circulating blood. So we call it C. There is a drug which is used in cancers. It's known as bevacizumab that prevents the formation of blood vessels. Okay. So that is also C-zumab, bevacizumab. Okay, we will do that some other time. And uh, <clears throat> now, Rivaroxaban and Apixaban, okay? Uh, again, they are, uh, they bind to active site of factor 10A. Therapeutic uses treatment and prevention of BVT and treatment of prevention of stroke and valvular, uh, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Both drugs are substrates for P-glycoprotein, which in a way means it will kick the drug out of the cells. Both drugs have fewer drug interactions. No monitoring is required for either region. We have Roxaban, uh, food increases its absorption. That is something about pharmacokinetics that you have to memorize, even if I read it to you. Metabolism is with these enzymes, CYP3A4. So any drug which is metabolized by CYP3A4 will be affected by the inducers or inhibitors of CYP3A4, all right? Well, one of the strongest in inducer is rifampine and inhibitor is cimetidine. There are many others, a long list. Uh, excretion, one third drug is ex excreted unchanged in urine and the rest is metabolized by the liver. Um, this, uh, it, this comes uh, as tablet. So it is uh, both these drugs, apixaban and rivaroxaban. They are oral, so we have got these non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants, okay? These are taken orally. Metabolism is primarily by CYP3A4 for apixaban. Excretion, 27% is excreted by the kidneys. So both these drugs are excreted and metabolized both by the kidneys and the liver, okay? Now this, we have got a reversal agent for these drugs as well. Look at the price, you know, $25,000 to $50,000. That is how these drug companies charge money. Um, and, uh, and Dexanet. And Dexanet is an antidote for medications, Rivaroxaban and Epixaban, when reversal of anticoagulation is needed due to uncontrolled bleeding. Anytime any patient can develop uncontrolled bleeding when he is taking these drugs. Okay. It is not found to be useful for other factor 10A inhibitors. This and Dexanet is only for these two drugs, okay? And it is given intravenously. Side effects uh, of this uh, antidote is pneumonia for some reason and infections. I really do not know what the reason is. And uh, serious uh, blood clots and cardiac um, effects, uh, cardiac arrest could occur, okay? Another question for you, we are almost coming to the end. Let us see if you can answer this one. A 72-year-old man recently diagnosed with atrial fibrillation started a treatment that included dabigatran, the inhibition of which of the following molecular actions most likely mediated the therapeutic effect of the drug in this patient. Right. Let us see whether you were paying attention or not. And I got one answer from Aisha, which is C, and that is excellent. Yes, the, all, all the other drugs in this, uh, group, in this group, they activate, inactivate, or they block factor 10A, whereas this one blocks thrombin activity. Dabigatran is a new non-vitamin K oral anticoagulant. So oral is the point to note that acts by binding reversibly to thrombin, thus blocking thrombin activity. Unlike warfarin, this direct thrombin inhibitor has a rapid onset of action. Warfarin takes some time, you know, two to three to four days, okay? Three to four days, you can say. Does not interact with P450 interacting drugs and gives a predictable anticoagulant response, making routine anticoagulation monitoring unnecessary. So it is quite commonly used, okay? Now, I think this is the last drug we should do. Then we will complete this section. It is a direct inhibitor of factor 10A. Uh, the FDA labeled, you know, sometimes we have off-label use as well. Off-label use uses are not illegal, okay? Uh, but these are the labeled indications by FDA. Treatment of deep vein thrombosis. 
treatment of pulmonary embolism, prevention of stroke and atrial fibrillation. We call that AFib, okay? Uh, for DVT and pulmonary embolism, it is used for after initial use of parenteral anticoagulants for five to 10 days. And again, it is a substrate for P glycoprotein, which will uh, pump it outside the cell, out of the cell. Limitation of use, do not use if creatinine clearance is 95 ml per minute because of increased risk of ischemic stroke compared with warfarin. Now, creatinine clearance. So that's a black box warning. What's the difference between creatinine clearance and GFR? Any idea? Is the creatinine clearance same as GFR? All right, you all are forgetting your physiology. Creatinine is filtered and a little bit of creatinine is secreted as well in the proximal tubule. So creatinine clearance is a little more than GFR. It is a good estimate of GFR, but GFR is always a little less than creatinine clearance because creatinine is secreted um, in the proximal tubule, okay? In transition to edoxaban from warfarin, discontinue warfarin and st start edoxaban when the INR is 2.5, okay? Adverse effects are bleeding and abnormal liver function tests. And if specific antidotes are not available, prothrombin complex concentrate, right? Maybe I have it somewhere in this lecture or in some other lecture, we have got certain things that could be given, you know, these, these are known as blood products, okay? So prothrombin complex concentrate or activated prothrombin complex, they, they, they include clotting factors, all right? And recombinant factor 8A are variously used as reversal agents in case of a major bleeding, okay? So we stop here. And tomorrow we are going to start with warfarin. If you have any question, you can ask me now. Otherwise, we will stop. All right, I don't see any questions, so we stop here today and we'll continue tomorrow.